We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you video games. But not your regular old fashioned ones, I'm talking about Adver Games. Advertisement video games. Because walking around outside and seeing billboards wasn't enough, now we're gonna be playing entire products that may or may not exist due to the inclusion of advertising. This can go all sorts of ways. Some shameless, others blatant, and most of the times the final product is terrible. It's also been going on forever. One of the first examples is 280 Zap, an arcade racer co-branded alongside the Nissan Datsun 280Z, and this was in 1977. One look at this cabinet and you know, though I don't know who this would convince to buy an entire car. Advertising and video games have been walking hand in hand prior to Mario being a twinkle in Nintendo's eyes and well, I guess that explains the game awards. The first widespread release and well-known case of Adver games was Tapper, a classic arcade title about sliding glasses filled with various substances down the bar top in order to appease customers. Oh, also, there's a massive logo hog in the top of the screen. Hello there. But this is just an ad inside the thing. We've gotta go deeper to the kids' meals and store shelves of yesterday. I hope you like mascots. So yo, it's Austin, and welcome to the lost era of advertisement video games. Except it's not totally lost because these things are still coming out today. Only a few years ago, we had that Colonel Sanders dating sim come out when all the brands were going hard on social media and the fact that that developer's name was Psyop is not lost on me. What's the first instance of an ad for game that you remember? For me, it was obviously the first time I poured out a big bowl of checks and saw a CD-ROM come out of it. Chex Quest, a Doom clone that we're definitely gonna be getting into later. But before we get started, we interrupt today's video about ad for games to talk about today's sponsor, Pixel Starships. Do you like space? Well, I recently came across this game called Pixel Starships. It's a sci-fi MMO where you take control and manage yourself a massive starship flying across the galaxy and doing space things. You can customize the layout of your ship, you can engage in battles with other players and explore individual star systems. It's got this addictive gameplay where you'll be micromanaging your crew while engaging in battles, which will mean targeting individual parts and really thinking about your layout. Pixel Starships is really easy to pick up and play in spurts. Since it's got a PC and mobile release, I've been kicking back after work and managing my little dudes on the go. I myself really like that PvP is easy to access. You can beat up other captains online at any time. Or, you know, get totally destroyed. I'm working on it. Pixel Starships is regularly updated with new content, it's not pay to win, and it's got a developer that listens closely to the community. They've even made it possible for you to create little character skins and share them with other players. So if you wanna take flight, click the link down in the description to download Pixel Starships today, and on arrival, you'll be receiving 100 extra Starbucks. Plus, you can use my code in game Austin Eruption to receive an additional 125. Check out Pixel Starships today. And now we re-re-interrupt your regularly scheduled program for or Adver Games, some of the worst things out there. This could mean anything though. I mean, technically Max Steel and the Dreamcast is an advertisement for a dead toy brand. All I know is that whenever you see one in the wild, you know. I wanna see games that exist purely because of the brand. I'm not talking about turning the corner in Homefront and seeing the ruins of a White Castle. I'm talking about going to the store, looking my mother directly in her eyes and crying out to the world, Ma, can we get McDonald's Treasureland Adventure? Not because I knew it was developed by the people who made Gunstar Heroes, but because I recognized the funny little clown on the box. Ronald McDonald has a lot of video games, but so does everyone else, and there's so many, so strap in. So what better way to get this train rolling than with video games based on some of our most basic needs. No, not basic shelter or companionship of the video game. I'm talking about food. If it goes in your mouth and had a funky mascot, then, well, it probably had a game. I actually just wrote in my script, uh, games based on eating stuff. Original, I know. No matter the generation, for better or worse, you'll be able to find yourself a few food tie-in games. I can't even call it a bygone era because you got stuff coming out as recently as June this year with Grimace's birthday. A real brand new Game Boy Color release. This is too good though, and too new. The first time a fast food chain would have itself a video game would be several Tuesdays ago with a brand that's not even in the States anymore, Wimpy. I'd gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Yeah, I'm sure all the kids know this guy. Well, this Popeye character's name, Jay Wellington Wimpy, inspired a bunch of restaurants in the 30s simply called Wimpy. Burgers, obviously. At a certain point, Wimpy ran out 
out of business in America, but was still knocking it out of the park in the United Kingdom. Wimpy needed itself a mascot, and they didn't just use the Popeye character, so they created Mr. Wimpy, and I kinda hate looking at him. What are these medals on his jacket honoring? Is, is he in the Secret Service? Well, in 1984, Ocean Software would help produce a promotional tie-in that was a total clone of Burger Time, and that's it. Walk over meat and cheese, dodge things, and reconsider playing anything else on your ZX Spectrum. Mr. Wimpy isn't very spectacular, but it was the beginning. Fast forward to the late 80s, and this is where things get wacky. I think when it comes to advertisement video games, one of the first things people think of is McDonald's, specifically McDonald's Land. McDonald's Land is a controversial and ridiculous concept. Sometime in the 60s, a bunch of suits were like, how do we get the children interested in forcing their parents to go to our mid-tier restaurant? And apparently, the answer was by creating a bunch of original characters, a whole universe with fantasy elements, and teaming up with every company under the sun to flood the market with stuff. We got cartoons, we got little golden books, we got commercials that were essentially shorts of these characters just doing stuff. I guess as a kid, seeing the Hamburglar Snatch Burgers was supposed to make me want to crawl around disease-riddled play places and try the latest Nintendo 64 games, each of which rocking some mad stick drift. But jokes on them, I preferred wearing a Burger King crown. More on them later. So with McDonald's Land would come a grand total of four full video games. Not kids meal toys, things that you had to buy at the store. We got three of them stateside, you just might not have heard of the Japanese exclusive Donald Land. Developed by Data East, this Famicom platform is about one and one thing only, scaring children. And not just in the way it looks, which is a bit unnerving. I mean, the trees stare at you anytime you jump on them. But it's also got that NES difficulty stemming purely from the jank. Every level has instant death pits that'll restart the stage, and for some reason, attack and run are on the same button, so you'll be slip sliding and trying to throw bombs at enemies. Also, why does Ronald use bombs? I'm just gonna accept it. Despite the borderline nightmarish representation of McDonald Land, this one ain't bad. It's a shelf above a lot of licensed stuff from the air. Era, although those games don't take me to a McDonald's order counter in between stages. They also didn't have enemies that look like this. I don't know why we didn't get Donald Land, but we did get the other NES release. Coming out in 1992, Virgin Games' McKids is easily the most famous of the bunch, at least in part due to its banging soundtrack. You don't play as Ronald this time around, instead you pick between one of two, uh, McKids I guess. Burger stolen by the Hamburglar, yada yada, go save the McDonald land and be wary of Ronald's immense back problems. Rather than being a straight platformer, this one's got more of your typical 80s puzzle elements with hidden objects in each stage, and you need these in order to make it to the next world to hang out with Grimace or whoever, so get to searching. Which in lies the problem. By the time this actually came out in 1992, you could and should be playing things like Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Mortal Kombat, heck, Super Mario World had already been out for well over a year. So go buy a Sega Genesis and boot up Global Gladiators instead, the supposed spiritual successor that came out in the same year. One look at the box and I, I don't see anything that says McDonald's. Even the back has, a, oh wait, there it is, so small. Global Gladiators did not want you to know what you were about to play. Virgin, are you, are you, are you ready? Yeah! The first part was bad enough already and reminded me of high school, but now we're being sonically bombarded by Tommy Tallarico saying, are you ready? And yeah, over the McDonald's golden arch. I was not ready. Are you ready? Yeah! yeah. Okay. Within seconds of turning on Global Gladiators, it becomes evident that you just got tricked into playing a Mickey D's co-branded pro-environmental video game because yes, apparently this needed to exist. The McKids are now McPreteens running around with mustard guns, squirting big globs of goo as they gladiate the globe, all while Ronald pretends he's not a part of the problem. Weirdly, this thing got pretty decent reviews and there's some neat stuff here. The animations are top notch for the time, the levels are colorful, and the music is all right. I don't know if the gameplay holds up, considering each level is collect a certain amount of golden arches and reach the end. No, we aren't telling you how many there are, idiot. There's also a weird momentum building to movement, so you'll be sure to fall in the pits and die thinking you've got enough speed. I also love how the game ends abruptly without any mention of McDonald's at all, almost as if the entire team hated it. Anyways, I think Global Gladiators is kind of stinky, but don't tell the reviewers from the 90s I said that. You know who isn't? Treasure. This Japanese
Japanese developer has made some of my favorite games of all time, like Guardian Heroes, Astro Boy Omega Factor, Gunstar, you name it. But their sophomore release just happened to be a promotional tie-in game with the fast food giant, and the one game that went full hand on the land part of McDonald's land, McDonald's Treasure Land Adventure. Nine syllables of synergetic power. It's also actually good, like, like really good. Developed alongside Gunstar initially because the devs needed money and a proven track record to get more work, McDonald's Treasureland Adventure feels like they had something to prove. One look at the box and you'd be forgiving and assuming that this is only meant for kids five and younger, but inside is a super solid platformer with multiple move mechanics and ridiculously good music. The story doesn't matter, the characters are whatever, it's just Ronald with a comically long chain in, except this time he could shoot sparkles out of his fingers. What matters is that it's got that treasure level of care put into it. Each stage has multiple moving elements, sometimes rhythm based, other times totally level warping. There's a stage where you walk past a mirror and see your reflection and sometimes an enemy will pop out. Sumo wrestlers can completely change the way a stage looks, causing you to have to think on your toes in midair. You use a freaking, I don't know, scarf in order to do vertical platforming. Boss fights are more than just slap and running and boy, the music goes unbelievably hard. This stupid looking game is literally a stupid food advertisement and I beat the whole dang thing for this video, which is really a testament to how good treasure is. If you can come to terms with playing this, I think it's a good time. Just try to keep that one to yourself. I already failed. McDonald Land and Ronald McDonald have faded away in recent times due in part to that killer clown scare in 2016, but I guess there's technically one more adventures through McDonald Land. It's just a point and click adventure with lots of mini games, one with with horrifying 3D visuals and maps that look like Planet Namek did meth. All you really need to know about this is that it was made by McDonald's Australia, and you can immediately tell. Welcome to my party, yeah, we're gonna have a ball. All my happy friends are here, so let's go meet them all. Treasure Land is hands down the best one of these so far, so let's go ahead and put that at the top of the list. Can it be beaten? Let's find out with a different fast food company, or in my case, walking across the street and grabbing myself the most Americanized version of tacos out there. Rather than spending money at a store, what if you got a game bundled with a kid's meal? If you did, you might have played Taco Bell Tasty Temple Challenge. Look, if you tell a 10 year old they can get a free game instead of some crappy Nintendo 64 plastic nonsense, they're taking the real game. Taco Bell Tasty Temple Challenge is simply a Doom clone, but instead of shooting the minions of hell with various weapons of minor and mass destruction, you're squirting snakes with hot sauce packets, which are apparently hot enough to burn animals alive. Uh, maybe we need a recall? This was a cross promotion for their long lost wild sauce, as well as a way to bring children and man children into the store in droves. It's just also about 25 minutes long and has less content than the shareware version of Duke Nukem 3D. It runs like crap, it looks the same the entire time, the JPEGs of tacos look too crunchy, and it definitely sucks, but they sure don't make them like this anymore. Instead, you just get, you know, fully fledged dating simulators for free where they turn Colonel Sanders into a sex symbol. Just don't. But the most famous of the fast food drive through video games has got to be the Burger King trilogy. Back in the mid 2000s, BK went full crazy with their marketing and turned their king mascot into this creepy guy who, well, I guess needed you to eat. People all over the states know the king, we get it. They would team up with developer Blitz Games in order to make a trio of products that you could buy at four bucks a pop, which is just a smidge more than the Oblivion horse armor. And you could take a physical disc home and enjoy a brand new 7th generation video game. Pocket Bike Racer, Sneak King, Big Bumpin', and most of them suck. Pocket Bike Racer is aggressively mid. It's a generic kart racer with minimum mechanics disguised as a motorcycle racer. It's largely forgettable. Sneak King is the most famous and also the worst by far. Imagine Metal Gear Solid, except not at all, where the only goal is to sneak up on people and force them to eat Burger King. I'd rather get Splinter Celled in real life. The best, and quote 
rotations of the bunch is Big Bumpin', which is just a top-down bumper cars game where you want to smack a puck into a goal. Kind of like Rocket League. It even predates supersonic acrobatic rocket power battle cars. Psionics eat your heart out. All three of these are essentially the type of things you'd see on Xbox Live Arcade for like three or five dollars. So they're pretty bare bones and inoffensive, but it definitely beats the heck out of the average kid's meal toy. Shout out to the guy with nearly 3,000 copies of Sneak King. I, uh, I hope you're doing all right. If you want to play an ad for game that'll make you feel just about nothing, the King Trilogy is for you. Sneak King was so hyped as like a notable bad game, but it's not really much of anything. It's just kind of there. There's a lot more food based video games that I could talk about, but I'm pretty full for now, so let's keep the ball rolling with the second most common type of advert game, sports and racing. Cars, skateboards, extreme sports, and toys. If I could pull off a sick trick on you, there's probably a cool video game about it. Well, maybe not cool. Speaking of, are Razor scooters still a thing? I sure hope so. Growing up just wouldn't be the same without random children slamming into the sides of parked cars on the side of the road. In the year 2000, this was the hottest new thing. And any game with a Razor scooter was automatically the coolest on the block. Just not if it was the video games. Razor Freestyle Scooter and Razor Racing for the everything at the time were shameless advert games and clones. The kid on the cover kind of looks like a young Tony Hawk about to totally beef it. And when you boot up the thing, you're greeted with the most 2000s art you've ever seen. Do you pick Chad? How about Amy with her blue hair streak? Neither strike your fancy. No worries, just go and unlock UFC fighter Tito Ortiz. Yeah, sure, this makes sense. He's just standing there. At its core, Razor Freestyle Scooter is just a low tier version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and I don't think anyone expected anything else. You get the thing because it's a cheap sports game, then maybe you convince your parents to spend $100 on something that'll end up with you having stitches. There's the Game Boy Color port, which feels like a discount version of Paperboy with a single button to do tricks. Also, a Game Boy Advance attempt that wanted to be the GBA version of Tony Hawk, but totally fails. Then there's another game with next to no information out there on it, Razor Racing. Yo, did they give up animating and decide to swap the static pictures in the middle of it? Razor Racing is essentially a palette swap, the Majora's Mask of Razor Freestyle Racing. But instead of centering the gameplay around doing tricks, it's instead about racing, which I don't know if you can tell, has practically no depth. You just kind of go and continue to clap occasionally for points on time trial mode. At the very least, the original is trying to be something. Razor Racing is confused, ugly, without any licensed music, Music and resembles a tech demo more than an actual game. This is what I expect from my adver games. 10 out of 10. If going outside and hanging with the cool kids wasn't an option, or if you only had $10 to spend, you could also invest in some tech decks. Who needs full-sized parks when you can fingerboard over the entire world? You're not seeing Razor scooter competitions these days. Take me down to the fingerboard championship so I can watch some finger masters at work. They definitely trained on tech deck skateboarding for the Game Boy Color. 7.5 out of 10 from GameSpot, let's go! What you see on the screen is all there is to see. You don't actually get points for tricks, you just collect other tech decks which are tiny on your poorly lit Game Boy Color in the first place. When even Nintendo Power says, eh, you know there's not much here. But that's not all. Screw just the board, we gotta focus on the dudes with Tech Deck Dude Bare Knuckle Grind. No, that's not a Streets of Rage reference, it's instead a barely functioning Tony Hawk clone. Who'd have thought? This was actually four different discs that were sold piecemeal that you would install on your computer in order to unlock more levels and characters. Unfortunately, they didn't account for Windows 11 being a thing, so I couldn't get it to properly work. They also canceled an Xbox port of this, so I suppose the world wasn't meant to see you. Which is fine, because honestly, they all just kind of look like wieners. I hate tech deck dudes. <laughs> Ah, oh, the sweet sound of another satisfied Thumbbuster customer. Tech Deck snowboarding is also a thing. I found this box on eBay and could not find any information on the internet regarding it, but that's because it's not a real video game. While looking in the files, I found a launcher for one Snow Wave Avalanche, which is an unrelated PC snowboarding game. They just brought this over to the States, swapped the name out, and didn't even put the little wiener dudes in. The back of the box shows screenshots that are all doodless which is just
just what I expect from something as bottom tier as an advert game. How about advert cars? Most vehicle and racing games are walking advertisements anyways. You can't put up a Forza or Gran Turismo without being bombarded with corporate logos every way you look. So how about racers and car sims that are specifically advertisements? Games designed to showcase one specific vehicle or make have been floating around since the 70s as we've learned, and the quality usually isn't there, lest we forget the entire Ford Racing series. You weren't driving around Bugattis in that, I'll tell you what. If you wanted to take, say, a Volkswagen Beetle onto the road, you'd have to pick up Beetle Adventure Racing for the Nintendo 64. Swinging in everywhere with ridiculously good reviews everywhere but Famitsu, clear Volkswagen haters, Beetle Adventure Racing was one of the best Nintendo 64 racers on a platform that had a lot of fantastic ones. Sure, these days it might feel a little bare bones, but it's embraced its silliness. I mean, there's only one car to play as, but the stats change with whatever paint job you pick. I like that the speedometer moves on the top left, and there's enough arcade racing fun here to be had for anyone. On the flip side, there's Yaris. 17, a 17, you gotta work for that. Look, I'm more of a Mazda guy myself, so count me in on the Yaris Haters Club. Delisted, cause it sucks probably. I, I'm not sure actually. Look, you could peek at any era of gaming and find yourself some sort of advert game based on whatever vehicle at the time. Automobili Lamborghini, Volvo the game, freaking F355 Challenge, Passion Rosa. Some are whatever, others are okay, and even more are flat out bad. Anyone wanna throw down on some Chrysler Classic Racing, a game where according to the back of the box, you play as a nerdy wallflower and attempt to become the coolest cat alive. Time to pull up in my PT Cruiser and ask the cool kids what they think about Return to Dark Tower and promptly get shoved in a locker. But at least I still have my copy of Jeep Thrills. Yeah, this is real and I bought it. Made by Game Sauce, the people behind My First Dollhouse in Little Britain, the video game, Jeep Thrills really wants to be Beetle Adventure Racing. Heck, it even takes a little inspiration from Cruisin' USA. But as a reminder, you're looking at a PlayStation 2 video game released in 2008. The next generation was already two years old, and you had better looking PlayStation 2 launch titles. Jeep Thrills is cheap, the controls are stiff, and I guess they realized it because this here's an arcade racer. You got a boost meter that fills up on the side at all times, but it usually just causes glitchy chaos. I'm just sitting here wondering, who, who's this for? The cover might be one of the worst I've ever seen. The words aren't centered, they're in different fonts, and I just realized no one's even driving any of the Jeeps. <laughs> what? Jeep Thrills is 100% prime cell game material, and the best thing going here is that there's actually car Jeep destruction, and that's pretty neat. To put things in perspective, you could have already been playing Forza Motorsport 2 for a whole whole year by the time Jeep Thrills came out. Heck, <laughs> Gran Turismo 4 for several. This is the game your parents bought you at the Bass Pro Shop Pyramid when they went to Vegas and saw the police on their final reunion tour without you. So One more stop on the extreme sports train, and this is on something that I think every generation had since the 80s. This is definitely the most American thing possible, but when I was a kid, Everyone wanted a Nerf gun. It's Nerf or nothing. I don't know about everyone else, but my childhood was filled with hurting myself on corners, edges, and all sorts of playground equipment. So it kind of goes without mention that I'd find some way to get smacked around with a Nerf gun or two. There was always that one kid who had the comically large sized blaster who'd hide on top of a slide. And while I wasn't him, I sure love me some foam darts. Hasbro's toy line is still immensely popular, so it shouldn't come to a surprise that it's gotten a few video games too. You might just be surprised to know that one of them is an Unreal Tournament clone. Nerf Arena Blast. I'm not really sure why these little darts are making big explosion noises and causing mass amounts of AOE damage, but I'll take it. Arena Blast is exactly what it looks like. It's a late 90s Twitch shooter with obnoxiously bright visuals and character designs that scream extreme. The intro here was thrown together by Mondo Media, who would later go on to make Happy Tree Friends, which is totally random, but also true. I'd be lying if I said this was bad, by the way. Considering it pulls from a lot of boomer shooters at the time, Nerf Arena Blast has you duck diving around corners 
person trying to aim shots in a way that only that era had. Every nerf dart has travel time, so you can't just hit scan things. You gotta account for distance and the moving trajectories. It's a pretty involved game. Considering I was nine and sheltered when this came out, had I known about its existence, I would have hopped online and played against other cool tweens until someone needed to use the phone. This thing's got better reviews than Starfield. Arena Blast is one heck of an advert game, especially considering most of what we've talked about so far, which makes the next nerf titles all the more disappointing. Nerf in Strike and Nerf in Strike Elite, two rail shooters that came with a big old plastic attachment with dual functionality. You want a Wii Blaster that can turn into a Dart Blaster with three whistling Sonic Micro Darts? Sure. After the fast paced action and silliness of the previous game, both of these come off poorly. They're four player rail shooters where you don't have any control over movement, you just aim at the screen and shoot. It's like Time Crisis, except without the fancy gun con kickback or uh, any personality. I do like that the darts fill up the stages as you blast away, but truly, these are two of the games of all time, barely above shovelware. Recently, there was Nerf Legends all the way in 2021 on the PlayStation 5. That's right, we've been getting Nerf or nothing games for well over 20 years. I actually covered this in one of my worst of videos though, so uh, well, that kind of gives it away. I'm trying to write anything about it from memory, but like most game mill products, it went in one ear and out the other. Most likely some kind of tax break. Nerf Legends looks like Overwatch, plays like Discount Overwatch, and has shooting that feels worse than a PlayStation 1 title. Avoid. And there was actually one more that unfortunately shut down already. Nerf Ultimate Championship was an Oculus Quest VR shooter that was delisted half a year after release. Online VR games are a gamble already, but I don't know what they were thinking with this. Look, the idea of playing with Nerf guns in a situation that isn't with real Nerf guns outside doesn't make sense in my brain. If we want a kid-friendly shooter, we got Fortnite for that. Also, I'm an adult. If anything, I'm gonna move on to paintball. Nerf out. I think everything we've tackled so far at the very least makes sense. I could see why you would want a cross-promotional McDonald's or Nerf game. So, what if we take things to a much weirder level? For instance, why would anyone in the right mind want a Gap Kids video game? Snow Day, the Gap Kids Quest. Why? The answer is no one, which is probably why these were given away for free. I'm actually surprised there's not more of these, but I guess making video games takes time and resources, even if it goes to something like this. Snow Day is a collection of mini games, two of which, according to the cover, are hidden unlockables. The thing would tell you to check your computer every week so you could figure out how to game, which sounds like a Trojan to me. You've got a Pac-Man clone, a Match the Pitcher, the worst ski-free ripoff you've ever played, and whatever this what? is. Gap Kids Quest is basically one of those terrible Flash games on the internet, except you needed to slap a disc in your computer to play it. Speaking of Flash games, there's a metric brick ton of these floating around that may have actually been lost to time. Back in 2001, sugar water giant Capri Sun launched this game called Planet Juice, and there's practically a single screenshot out there. This thing was multiplayer, apparently, but beyond that, there's a neat article in Wired talking about this virtual world that in the year 2023, maybe five people know of? Sugary drinks, soda, and junk food have a ton of advert games. What better way to sell yourself to kids than to entice them with one of them fancy video games? You got M&Ms, Pepsi, Coke, 7-Up, even Red Bull breakdancing on the DS. All I want for Christmas is a brand new copy of Red Bull BC1. Said no one. I'll come back to the sugary stuff another day because there's literally another full video worth here and I had to swing the axe to get this thing out on time. So instead, let's talk about Hooters Road Trip. Come on, this way to the test track. Guess what? It happened again. Another day, another palette swap. Hooters Road Trip is a conversion of a PC title called Free Will in USA. Except this time it's not difficult to find and was instead published by Ubisoft. Released at a respectable $9.99 in 2002, Hooters here is corny cheesecake at its finest. It's technically a racer, just the whole concept's about going on a road trip. I guess in Free Will you just be driving town to town doing road tripping things. In Hooters road trip, you're driving city to city from Hooters to Hooters. Is Hooters the only restaurant in this world? Is this post-apocalyptic? You can tell they just slapped the theme on top of the original because there's absolutely no chicken wing presence in the gameplay at all. Instead, it's just sloppy and slippery driving across the countryside as a red truck barrels through traffic. He's gotta get to Hooters first. Yeah, you finished first. 
Wait, no, I literally didn't. Similarly to Jeep Thrills, I feel like this one could have benefited from going full cruise in USA. I'm surprised that there's no Hooters girls on the side of the road or even like a billboard. You can trick people into thinking that you're not playing a schlocky Hooters game for several minutes at a time. And let's be real, that's a failed ad for game. Anyways, the worst thing about this is that the music defaults to this one butt rock track that plays over and over. So you have to manually change it to random. And if you don't, Buckle up, we're gonna get some wings. Just make sure to put on some Axe body spray so the waitresses don't run away. By that, I mean going to mojomastergame.com and playing Mojo Master, a game about picking up a date with the power of Axe Unlimited. 100 different women. Has this worked for anyone? Um, uh, yeah, this is pretty much exactly what I expected. Also, pause, computer enhance, that is definitely the same five girls over and over. Mojo Master has lost media at this point, and that's probably okay. I do find it strange that the girls are all elemental based, and that this was developed by the people who brought us kid-friendly Diablo clone fate. But, fuck them kids, grab your Atari links and head out to the corner store. It's time to play the cancelled Marlboro Go. Move over Pokemon Go, it's time for a new outdoor activity. This obviously never came out, but the fact that this was being considered and developed by not just one person, but multiple teams of people really shows how different the 90s were. They even made this big ugly links to promote it. Also, nearly five years no smoking for me. No big deal, MBD. Anyways, let's make our way to the happiest place on Earth in the form of a disc that you would buy from a Staples, the Walt Disney World Explorer. If there ever was an advert game that would work, it'd be Disney World Explorer. It's uh, literally in the name. You click around the park that you're not currently at, looking at pictures of various attractions you're not attending and learning a self-serving history lesson. There's little trivia bits for each attraction, and I guess that's fun for a very specific type of kid in the 90s. They even made a second edition and presumably wanted to keep this thing going, but that never happened. Less of a game and more of an application, but it seems to be a lot of nostalgia for those who piped this into their computers. Which one's better, this or a Universal Studios theme park adventure for the GameCube? But probably the one with the actual gameplay, huh? So far, we've talked about mostly American chains, but obviously there's gonna be a lot more advert games outside the States. That includes some that are decent, too. Yoshinoya is the Japanese Japanese Gyudon equivalent of McDonald's, and somehow they got an advert game on the PlayStation 2 made by the same people who designed Operation Darkness and the Cotton series. It's called, uh, Just Yoshinoya, and the entire experience is a fast-paced diner service sim. You run, you press the buttons that appear on the screen, and deal with patrons before they rage. Basically, the same thing as Diner Dash, but with a cuter style and crappy customer boss fights. Or perhaps you want to be on the other side of customer service. UK retailer game presents Christmas Shopper Simulator. Just typing in the name brings up a ton of meme Let's Plays from the 2010s, so you know exactly what this is. Nonsense. Which is also how I feel about the mission. Does anyone know this? In the year 2000, Nike ran this ad campaign starring a bunch of famous soccer or football players. They are set on a mission to retrieve a ball, but not just any ball. It's the Nike Geo Merlin, apparently the roundest ball ever made. So in this commercial, they they break into this museum, they avoid motion detection lasers until they don't, and then get attacked by a bunch of ninjas. They're like dribble fighting dudes in kendo suits with a soccer ball. Then there's robots, then the robot boss gets destroyed by an elevator. Nike. Apparently, the publisher, Microids, who have been around that long, decided they needed this to become a video game, and what they made is one of the worst things I've ever played. The mission has some of the most terrible controls I've ever used. It's a hybrid of a soccer video game and a third person uh, platformer beat em up. You have to hit enemies with balls and when you don't have it, you can't do any attacks. They just hold on to it until you steal it back. I was stuck trying to disarm this fuse box for a solid 20 minutes, not understanding the controls until I found out the only way to properly lob the ball is to fill your meter up halfway, release the button, and then immediately press down on the D-pad. There's no manual rip anywhere, and the tutorial does not explain this, so I tracked down a review on Moby Games to figure it out. This is all I could find. The mission is terrible, and if they were trying to sell me on the Nike Geo Merlin, you can barely see the thing. Whoa, is that the world famous roundest ball ever? Needless to say, I think they failed their mission. <laughs>
Alrighty, y'all, I got one more for today and I think you know what's coming. When you think of an adver game, there's most likely a single title that comes to the mind. It's gotten sequels, it's even got an HD remake, but there's only one Chex Quest. Help Chex Man battle the Flamoid, he saves the planet for Zoe. I loved Chex Quest. I also don't have too much to say that hasn't already been said. Chex Serial needed an ad campaign, so General Mills threw some money at a smaller game developer, Digital Cafe, to create an adver game. It wasn't uncommon for kids' cereal boxes to have prizes in them. Kellogg's and other companies have been doing that since the early 1900s. Chex Quest would be the first video game to become that free prize. But it's funny when you realize it was straight up a Doom clone. No, a Doom total conversion. One of the most controversial and violent games from the early 90s into this kid-friendly serial man blasting away green aliens called Flamoids. It also has the best CG intro. Two days ago, we lost contact with Bazoik. Preposterous. We have a nutritional development center in the caverns of Bazoik. They're growing fruit and vegetables, and they haven't had any trouble. Chex Quest isn't amazing, but it's also not that long of a title. The whole thing clocks in at less than an hour, and you'll be done so. But it's definitely the highest quality adver game we had seen at this point. Considering it is essentially an easier version of Doom, an already fantastic release, it was hard to go wrong. I played the crap out of this thing. As a kid, when you got a new video game for free, it became a treasure trove that you exploited until the disc stopped working. Whenever you beat it, you were greeted with a message that said mission continues at chexquest.com but unfortunately that website's been dead for so long even the Wayback Machine can't pull it up. However, that doesn't stop me from talking about Chex Quest 2, Flemoids take Chextropolis. General Mills realized they had a cult hit on their hands and rushed out a sequel. In an interview with Level Save, developer Charles Jacoby suggested they wanted it out quick. Considering it was available for download less than a year after the original, you can really tell in the level design. Chex Quest 2 feels like it was made on a strict timeline, and the final product reflects that. Then, radio silence. This is when the cult hit status began to grow. More and more people would release fan-made Chex Quest games, some really good, until finally, in 2008, a real Chex Quest 3 would be released. While technically not official at the time, it was still a new game in the series that had a wild following online. It's the beefiest of the bunch, had a lot of care put into to the levels and even has a proper the end screen where Chex Man gives us one heck of a dream work smirk as we ride off into the sunset. A happy end for all, right? Not if capitalism has anything to say about it. Chex Quest HD. This is uh, a little loud. I guess enough time had passed that General Mills was wanting to recreate their own adver game, so in 2020 they'd release Chex Quest HD once again for free. But this time with multiple characters and co op, because instead of cereal, this would be an adver game for Chex Mix, the bane of anyone sitting at their desk at 1 a.m. wanting a snack. HD here has a lot of the original developers, it has a lot of love by big fans of the trilogy, and well, it's hard to judge anything that's totally free. But unfortunately, by taking the Doom away from Chex Quest, we instead got a relatively run-of-the-General Mill shooter, which made me want to boot up the old CD-ROM instead. Or a launch Z-Doom. A cute thing to exist for sure, but it pales in comparison. The field of view is obscured by the Chex armor, most of the levels are really dark and muddy, and some of the sounds are messed up. I didn't get a chance to try out the multiplayer, but hey, I am glad this exists. If anything, it'll make people want to try out the original, and I think that's totally worth it. At the very least, it gave us an HD version of Chex Warrior deboarding his spaceship. My dreams into nightmares. Chex Warrior reporting for duty. Oh no! So there you have it, a bunch of advertisement video games, and if Chex Quest HD is anything to go off, I think we'll be seeing these for years to come. I didn't even touch mobile, which is where a vast majority of these go now. I mean, that's basically what the official Jeremy Renner app is. What's your favorite advert game? Is, is that a sentence anyone's ever said? Mine is probably, unironically, that treasure game from earlier, although all it really does is make me want to boot up Dynamite Heady or Gunstar Heroes and 
that's also fine. If you liked today's video, make sure to check out the sponsor, Pixel Starships. You can click the link down in the description and use the code Austin Eruption in order to get yourself started flying around the galaxy today. It all goes into helping the channel out, or if you wanna support us directly, you can head over to the Patreon and become a Patreon supporter or buy a t-shirt over at the Pixel Empire. This year's the last video before Christmas, so happy holidays, everyone. But we're not done with the year yet, so stay tuned. Anyways, I've been Austin, and catch me next time when we partake in our annual tradition of terrible video games. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Quolek, Benna Oswald, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, Dylan Snyder, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Idlevice, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arter, Ryan Talbert, and Vox. Thank you all so much for the generous support. So recently, I finally managed to get all my friends into playing Fortnite, which is basically a massive amalgamation of brands just like this video. I mean, there's even Nerf in it. There's just also Peter Griffin and like April O'Neil hitting the gritty together. The point is this, if you ever see me collab in a game like that, something has stolen my body. Please stop them. Happy holiday, my goobs. Go play some video games and be decent to each other. Also watch wrestling.